Armstrong, and I live in Boise, Idaho. I work for the Wildland Fire Management RDNA group, and we do all kinds of things. You know, we do WIFDIS, IFDDIS. We go out as fire behavior analysts and LTANs and do a lot of that in the summertime. So a lot of fire behavior. I do a lot of training, tech transfer, and I've been helping um, rewrite the burn boss classes, actually. We offered the uh, rewrite, the first test course for that in December here in the Great Basin. So that'll be coming folks' direction. Um, if any of y'all end up helping teach that, maybe in your region or or whatnot. So um, anyway, that's kind of what my deal is. And I'm really interested in fuels. I spent about 10 years in the Southeast as an FMO and a prescribed fire specialist and burned a lot of acres there in Florida and around North Carolina and that area. And I've lived in Boise for about 12 years and um, been sort of doing this, this uh, you know, decision support thing. So what I wanna to talk to you guys today is, I wanna talk about IFTDIS and how it relates to using a little more spatial approach to using this, these kind of outputs in your burn plan. I know I've been teaching folks behave for many, many, many years. And I think, I think there's a better way of doing business. Not that there's not things in behave that still are useful because they are, but I know a lot of the stuff that came out of the national review and even just the stuff that we teach in, um, in the burn boss class, we get a lot of really great feedback from folks when we show them the behave stuff, or sorry, the if does stuff, um, as it kind of relates to behave, kind of like a comparison. Um, so what I wanna show you about if does here, I'm gonna jump to some slides um, here in a second. Can you guys still hear me? Is someone eating like chips? <laughs> I'm not hearing yeah. you, Dennis. Sorry, buddy. You got me now, Kim? I got you now, yeah. Okay. I think we got it. <laughs> we good? <laughs> God, I love this. This is awesome. All right. Uh, okay, so for the FTDIS homepage, I just want to point out a couple things. Um, so on when you go to IFTDIS, if you want to find help, there's this user support button up here. And if you click on that, it takes you to the um, help center. And all of the help stuff is just in these little drop downs. You can find all kinds of things. There's tutorials. Uh, we've got a whole bunch of recorded webinars. Um, there's just a myriad of things. So if you get stuck, you can always find stuff. We always have a whole bunch of things linked on the home page here. Um, and then like I said, here's the webinar page. It's probably kind of slow loading on your side, but anyway, we've got a lot of, like this is a, a thing I did on, similar to what I'm gonna show you today, uh, on holding and using if desk for your burn plan. So anyway, there's a ton of recorded webinars. Anyway, lots of places to learn, to learn stuff. The other thing we did is, this is the Wildland Fire Learning Portal, and we built two online courses that are available on this on-demand self-enroll kind of thing. So you don't have to have anything special. Anybody can get in here. Uh, this is the IFTDIS overview, which is brand new, updated, and it gives a great overview of IFTDIS. And then this other one is how to use it for your burn plan, which I'll touch on some of that stuff today. This one's kind of still draft. I'm still looking for some feedback from that. So um, anyway, those are the two that are here. There's some other good courses in here too that talk to fuel moisture and fuel uh, model selection. I know that was a big deal that, came out of the review stuff. So anyway, there's some other little nuggets that are useful, I think, on this learning portal page. Okay, so I'm gonna switch over now to some slides and we'll walk, and I know I got, I got you guys after lunch, so that's really great. So I am gonna hopefully keep y'all awake. And uh, if I could, I would throw things at you all, um, but I can't, so. If you guys have questions as I'm going along, please feel free to jump in and you know we can chit chat about stuff. And uh, I wanted to do a live demo, but I don't know if that's really gonna work out. So I might just kind of skip that. All right, so I'm gonna turn off my camera just to reduce some bandwidth here. And let's see if my screen sharing skills are not awesome either, but we're gonna try. Okay, so here, hopefully you're seeing PowerPoint now. And I'm going to try this presentation mode thing. Okay, and then I go up here and I switch. Okay, so you guys seeing the slide and not the notes, I hope. All right, we're good. All right, so let's cruise through this. Um, 
So basically, I want to talk to you guys just about how IFTDisk can help with your burn plans. And I'm going to specifically address kind of four things that came out of the quality assurance checklist in the review. Um, but I really want to talk about things more as just best management practices, really. But we want to look at the map. That's my take home message for all of this. Is this really, IFTDisk is useful because it contains a map and behave does not. So I really kind of want that to be the take home here. Um, we can also look at fire behavior on the map, um, which again, isn't just a number out of behave, but it's actually a, a picture of it. And then using that to look at uh, holding, which I think is kind of a big deal. Okay, so I already talked about the portal. Okay, so this quality assurance checklist, this was the thing that was in the appendix. And um, like I said, I just want to, I just want to touch on these. I'm not going to, you know, go into great detail, but I want to just show you how they kind of relate. But really, to me, this is really these are really just best management practices. I mean, review or not, I think these are great things that we should be doing and um, should sort of learn to do and then and teach each other how to do as as we go on. Especially if you're doing a technical review on any burn plans, looking for these things as sort of a best management practice, I think is is really the way to go. Um, OK, so now I'm stuck here. OK, so the five elements, and I'm really going to just focus on four, but um, are element four, looking at your fuel models, looking at your prescription. And then these last three, I think of kind of as a package deal, really, um, mostly because when I used to, when I, I haven't written a burn plan, I've reviewed a lot of burn plans lately. Um, mostly when I look at that stuff, I'm, looking at the holding plan and I'm seeing if the holding plan actually informed the organization and equipment part. I've always thought these were ordered backwards in the template. I really think you should talk about, you should think about holding and contingency first and then worry about your organization and equipment. So that's kind of always, that's why I circled these because I really think of them as a package deal. Okay, so those are, that's what we're going to talk about. I'm going to use one example. This is an example that came from the folks on the Sawtooth, which is just southeast of Twin Falls, that part of the forest. So it's southern Idaho. And uh, thanks a ton to Stacey Tyler, who wrote this plan. And they're wait, just waiting for a window to implement it. Um, but they used 50 disks in this plan. And I'm going to kind of show you what, what their approach was. Um, I think it covers a lot of those pieces. So using Google Earth, this is just looking at the burn unit itself, looking north. You can kind of see the lay of the land, uh, the slope, the aspect, um, some of the ag land in the background. And um, I'll show you a map here in a second, but you get the idea of kind of where we're at. This was a springtime picture, I think. So as the snow was coming off the mountain, um, just above the burn unit. So this description of the fire area piece, this element four, the big things that came out of that were looking at the fuel models and making sure the ones that you pick actually make sense. Um, and then why did you pick them? Because there's a lot of there's a lot of nuance in these fuel models, right? And we're really just looking for fire behavior. I want to pick the fuel model that gives me the fire behavior that I think is going to happen on the ground. Um, and sometimes when we look at those, especially when we look at this data, sometimes it's different than what's on the map in land fire. A lot of people will look at the map and go, well, that's not right. But just keep in mind that land fire is just a place to start. And then we have to use our own expertise and our knowledge of the burn unit and the landscape to make adjustments. And that's just normal. That's just what we do, uh, regardless of whether it's prescribed fire or wildfire. So I really want to focus on looking at IFTDIS and using this fuel model stuff to understand what's there. So this is element four. Uh, help improve the, the this part of the plan. Uh oh. Am I still well, sharing? You got me? Yep. Is it lag? Can you hear me now? Nobody move. Nobody move. Sorry. All these provocative poses that leaves you in little freezes like that. <laughs> Kim, you got us? Hello? 
Yeah. What happens when you shoot down the balloon? Yeah. Well, I should put a camera back on. Make it clear. Okay. Am I back? You're back. I'm back. Am I back? All right. Everybody focus. She's back. Sorry. <laughs> You're fine. You're fine. It's, you guys are awesome. Just play, like thank you for just being patient. I I don't know what the deal is. All right. So oh, element four, if you just output using these things in this part of the plan to talk about topography, uh, to look at the vegetation and fuels both in the burn unit, but in my opinion as a burn boss, more importantly, outside of the burn unit. Um, that's usually the thing I care about most. Um, yes, I want to meet objectives for the burn, but I really don't want to lose it. So knowing what's going on outside the burn unit, in my opinion, is probably more important. And then maps. We all love maps. And I think having good maps and descriptive maps and maps that tell stories and add to our text that we write is really key. So this is in IFTDIS. If we were looking at the IFTDIS screen, we'd turn on our burn unit and we turn on these layers and we can just look at what's going on. So um, the tool in IFTDIS is this little eye tool and you can click anywhere on the map and you can get a bunch of information. So we can figure out exactly what the elevation is here, what the slope is, what the aspect is, um, all of that good stuff. So IFTDIS is great for that, just getting a feel for what you got. If you need to describe it in that element four, you can get that information from here. This is aspect, another important one. You, could, you saw from that Google Earth image that this burn unit is has a lot of north facing aspect to it. And that can be really important, obviously, depending on time of year that we're burning. You know, if it's holding a lot of moisture because it's north facing, that's gonna change your fuel moistures and it's probably gonna affect ignition and other things. Um, and we might wanna describe that in, um, in that element four section. So, you know, taking a snapshot of this or a little screen capture, and talking about it is if that's going to be a real impact on your on your fire behavior, then here's here's a good way to do it. So aspects really important, and then of course fuel models that's the big deal. Um, and using IFTDIS to turn on the land fire data to actually look at the fuel models and see the distribution of them across the landscape. So in this case, um, the blue is the burn unit, and then you can see this really fine black line. Um, that's a that's a treatment area that the forest did prior to burning. So I'm going to explain that here in just a second. But same thing, I can take the little identify tool, I can click anywhere on this map, and I can find out what the fuel model is according to land fire. Now it's up to you to say, is that correct? Is it really brush or grass or timber um, of some kind? Did they map that correctly? So and if it's not, there's some easy tools in IFTDIS to make those adjustments. In this case, with um, with the sawtooth, I'm, sw I'm switching slides now to this one that shows this area that they did a bunch of slashing. And the idea here is that they, they went in, this burn is to improve elk habitat. So it's to do a lot of regen for aspen. Um, so they wanted to slash this area so they'd get better um, consumption and just better fire effects. So, so we did, they did that. They actually went in and did the, so this is like the NEPA part, really. They did the slashing um, treatment. And now because it changed the fuel models, right? That's what they need to use to run their fire behavior for their actual prescribed fire. So that's what we did in here. We went in and we said, okay, all of everybody within this, all the pixels within this purple area are now going to be a slash model. We're gonna be an SB model. And then this area over here is a dug fir stand that they also felt because it was has north facing aspect, it held a lot more moisture. So its fire behavior was going to be a bit different than what was being mapped in land fire. So they changed the fuel model in that dug fir stand to reflect. Um, they went from a, a timber understory model to a timber litter model, which basically just is a little less fire behavior in the timber litter model. So we just made that change. Now we're good. Now you can see we've got a map that, that accurately represents what is happening on the landscape. The, uh, you can also see that the fire behavior that's gonna happen inside of this burn unit is going to be drastically different than what's gonna happen outside of the burn unit because of the mechanical treatment that occurred. So the fuels outside of the burn unit didn't change, um, but they did on the inside. So if we got a spot fire or something like that, 
we need to keep that in mind and we'll talk about that in the holding section here in just a second. So granted we can you know when we now we're going to the next step what we're going to do is talk about fire behavior as it relates to this stuff. So now we have a good picture of the map. We kind of know what's going on. We know a little bit about elevation and aspect and, and fuels. So we could take these and this was the before, right? This is before they did any mechanical treatment. And these are the charts and graphs and stuff that you can get out of IFTDIS. So you can get a little thumbnail image. You can get a breakdown of the fuel models, which is part of that description of the fire area. And if you're a pie chart kind of person, you can use a pie chart or you can use a bar chart, whatever you like. But what I like to do is just drop these into the burn plan. So this was before they did any of the slashing treatment. And then we have the map that I showed you that was purple that's after the slashing treatment. So now we can see it, what we changed. So we went from before and we took a lot of that dark green out of there. That was that timber understory model. And we converted that to this um, slash model, which is the purple. And then that dug fur area, which we said, we don't want you to be timber understory and dark green. We want you to be light blue and we want you to be timber litter because we don't want you to burn as hot. We don't think you will burn as hot. So we made those changes. So now we can see the before and the after. So great, now we're set. Now we know exactly what's on the ground. We can stick this into our burn plan. So this is the element for actually in the document. And uh, rather than having to write a whole bunch of text to explain this, we can just drop these little images in here and maybe write a few captions. Saves a lot of writing and it really helps the reader uh, understand the story. So if you were picking up this burn plan, you wouldn't have to read all this. You could just look at the pictures and kind of get a feel for what's happening. So I know a lot of you folks may, may or may not actually be running IFTDIS and, and that kind of thing. Uh, maybe you're the more on the implementation side versus the plan writing side, and that's fine. I think the important thing about this is if you want to learn how to run the tools, that's great. But you should also just have an understanding of what these things look like. So if someone hands you a plan like this or wants to talk to you a little bit about some concerns they have, you're familiar with what the images look like. It's like, oh yeah, I've seen that before. And you, you know, then you can kind of get a grasp for it and just kind of run with it. So I know we talk a lot about using these tools and but clicking the buttons and being the driver of them, but I think it's really important to um, keep in mind that it's just really good to be familiar with what these outputs look like and what they mean and where they come from. Um, so anyway, I think dropping this stuff into the, the document like this is really helpful. A lot of times we want to shove a lot of these things into the appendix and that's okay. You don't want to overdo it in your document, but um, a lot of things get lost in the appendix. I can't tell you how many burn plans have been sent to me to be reviewed, and they sent me the, the body of the burn plan, and nobody attached the appendix. So I'm like, and all the good stuff, at least I think, is in the appendix. I need the maps. I need all this thing if I'm going to do a technical review. So that's why I like the key features, the things that really matter to show up in the burn, in the body of the burn plan if possible. But again, you don't want to overdo it because your document would be super long. So, um, so let's talk about prescription now. So now that we know what our mo our fuel models look like, now we have to. This is back to that checklist stuff, that quality assurance checklist. Um, these are the things that were pointed out that we need to kind of little do a little better job on. And that's when we write our prescription, we need to meet our objectives um, for the burn, but we also need to provide for that perimeter control, which is you know keeping it in in the burn unit. Um, looking at uh, crown fire potential, depending on your fuel types, is also kind of important. And we can do that visually in IFTDIS. You can do it in Behave, but it's not visual. It's not you don't know where any of this is happening when you use Behave. IFTDIS shows you where. Um, and then, of course, any of the prescriptions, the pieces of the prescription you develop should flow into your holding plan. Um, so that's what we're going to talk about here with prescription stuff. So in the old days, we used to teach nomograms. Um, we don't teach those in 390 anymore. I wish we did, actually. But so nomograms were sort of like the, you know, the it's behave on a piece of paper, essentially. So you would put in your um, fuel moistures. And then you would run the box around the nomogram, right? And then you get your output for flame length or rate of spread. And then if you had a low fuel moisture, um, meaning it was dry, you'd have a really uh, big box because your outputs would be large. If you had a high fuel moisture and things were wet, you'd have a little box 
and you'd have um, a low number on your output. And all that behave is doing, at least for the surface fire stuff, is it took all the nomograms and it made it a computer. So you didn't have to draw lines on a nomogram. So that's behave, at least for the surface um, stuff. So you're just getting numbers. So if DDIS takes that one step further, it takes the fuel models and the map, and it, it basically runs behave on every single pixel. And it already knows a lot of these things. So it does, you don't have to tell it a lot. Um, it knows the elevation, it knows the aspect, it knows the fuel model, um, and, it, and it does the calculations, and it gives you a color on a map that represents the number that you would have gotten in behave. So that's what the upper, um, that's what the upper uh, picture is. The lower picture is a little more advanced model, that's the fire spread stuff, and I'm not going to talk too much about that today, but I just wanted to show you a picture of kind of what it looked like. It's a great way to game out spot fires and, uh, and that kind of thing. But um, that's that's a that's a chat for another time. So um, what I want to do is focus on the outputs that look like this upper right hand box, which is pretty much similar to behave. OK, I'm going to stop really quick. Can you guys a, still hear me, still see my screen? And um, does anyone have any questions? We're doing good, Kim. We can hear you so far. The presentation's great. Does anybody have any questions? We got nothing from the room and they they know we can interrupt you as you go through if they got something. Okay. Yeah, that sounds great. And if I um we'll have some time at the end too, so we can chat some more. Okay, so prescription, our favorite thing. To me, prescription used to sort of be like the crux of the burn plan. Like we all got all worked up about getting a prescription together. I actually think now the holding plan is kind of the place to really spend time, but the prescription should feed right into your holding plan. So that's how I'm going to put these things together. So this is element seven. Um, and the thing we get in the template's pretty minimal, right? This is all we get in the template. Of course, you have to read the implementation guide to get all the stuff out of, you know, what am I supposed to do for these very, um, very limited kind of bullets in the template. This, the, what's on the right part of the screen is what we usually see. Most people produce a prescription, which is, fuel moistures, uh, relative humidities, flame length, or sorry, uh, wind speed, um, that kind of stuff. So that's what's here in the upper right. So that's kind of a traditional prescription. And then you get fire behavior outputs in the bottom part of the, of the thing. So based on these numbers in your table and your prescription, you get your flame lengths and your rate of spread and stuff like that. So that's what we get um, the traditional way. And so what I want to show you is this is behave, right? This is probably what we're most familiar with. Um, the inputs we use in behave are, are, I think this should look familiar. You know, we have to put our fuel mo models in. So we have to pick them and say, for these fuel models, this is what I want to see the fire behavior for. Like in IFTDIS, we have the map, right? So we don't have to tell it that. We just, it knows that because it's looking at the map. Um, in this case, I wanted to get some of this crown fire type. So I, you have to put in these numbers, right? Crown canopy base site and canopy bulk density in order to get that. Well, if you just can actually provide you those numbers, it, that's inherent in the map in the land fire data. Um, fuel moistures in, in behave, we entered the numbers just like, um, you know, one hours, 10 hours, hundreds, uh, live fuel moistures. And that's what we do in if you And then we have to add some wind. And then we say, if we want a, a spread distance, we have to give it a time. So that's what's going on in behave. So I think that's familiar. And the output, as you guys all probably already recognize, based on each fuel model, you get your rate of spread, you get your flame length. In this case, I did give it a time, so we actually have a distance. And then this was the crown fire thing. So you can do that in behave, right? The crown fire type. All right, uh -oh, let's see if I can get to the next slide. Okay, so this is IFTDIS. Very similar, this is an input screen for IFTDIS. So um, if you are gonna run that same type of fire behavior to get flame length and rate of spread, this is how you do it in IFTDIS. You, in this case, you had to draw your landscape and get that fuel data and then adjust your fuel data like we did. Um, then we have to add our wind speed. In this case, we have to give it a wind direction. That's a little different than behave. And IFTDIS has some options for, and it uses in the background, it uses a program called Wind Ninja 
to actually, um, and you guys probably have used that or maybe heard of it, but it takes the wind and then it um, adjusts it for any terrain. So it's a little better representation of, um, of wind because it takes topography into account. Then we add our fuel moistures, just like we did in Behave, seven, eight, nine, 90 and 120, that's our one tens, hundreds, and our live fuel moisture, and we give it a name. In this case, this is gonna be my moderate prescription parameters. So this is like the middle. So then I would do the low end of my prescription and I would do the high end of my prescription. So I'd basically run this in, in IFTDIS three times. So I'd have low, moderate, and high. So once you do that in IFTDIS, we have this really cool little tool now that you can just compare these things next to each other. So kind of like you would do in behave in your table, in this case, you're just, but now we get to look at it on the map, right? And we still have our input. We still have a table. Um, so in this case, all I did in this case was to adjust the fuel moisture. I didn't change anything else. Um, so on the low end, like the wet end of my prescription, you can see the image that shows up after I run that one moderate and then high kind of like you'd expect right the colors gradually get a little more red a little more orange a little more yellow as you go across your and now i can see where the fire behavior is going to happen you can't do this and behave you can see it on the map in ifty this you can see the red pixels you can see the yellow and the green so you can say to yourself wow okay if i'm going to get that kind of fire behavior like for example on the west side of the burn unit that might cause me a little problem on the high end. Look at all that red there. So, and then you can click on the map and get the actual numbers so you can understand what are the flame lengths? What is the rate of spread? So it takes, to me, it just gives you a little more, actually, in my opinion, gives you a lot more information than behave because to me, in this stuff, location of the fire behavior means everything. So that's why I really like this, um, this little compare weather thing. You could go in and you could adjust these, you could copy your run, change your inputs. Maybe you want a higher wind speed or a lower wind speed, and then you just rerun it, and then you can look at that next to everything else. So I like that feature in IFTDIS. It's nice to be able to look at the stuff on the map. Okay, from that, I was going to do a demo, but I think I'll skip that because uh, given our internet situation, so we'll skip demo. Maybe we can try it at the end if we want, but. Um, this will be so exciting. I don't think we'll need to. <laughs> All right, so this is what I like to do with this prescription stuff when I'm done running it in IFTDIS is I want to be able to put it into my burn plan. So just like we had before, we have our table of our inputs. We have our fire behavior outputs in the table form. And then I like to drop the images right in here just to say, this is what I'm running. Now, if I'm sitting down with a line officer or a biologist or a resource person, whatever it might be, we can actually talk about it um, and have some visuals about where the fire behavior is going to happen. So that's how I like to do my prescriptions because um, I got to have, I'm like, I need pictures for everything. <clears throat> okay, so now we're going to transition to holding. So as we go from our prescription, like I said, I, from the very beginning, I think everything in our prescription should really translate to holding. Because if I'm gonna burn under those conditions, that's what I should be most worried about. And um, this again is the stuff from the, uh, the quality assurance review stuff. And I think the take home messages here are that, like I said, where the fire behavior occurs is really important. And then for you, knowing the burn unit, knowing the landscape, walking out in the woods to say, hey, that, that fire behavior thing I got showed all this red stuff on the northeast corner. Is that right? Does that make sense? Is there something here that is causing that to happen? And if so, if it is right, then maybe we should mitigate it on that northeast corner. You know, um, Maybe it's not right and I need to go make some adjustments in my model. So that, that's good. And then the other thing you can do is game out those wind events. Like I said, a lot of times wind event or drop in RH are the two things that cause us the most problem. So, because drop in RH equates to lower fuel moisture, which is why we have problem fire behavior. <clears throat> so, if we look at our prescription, low, moderate, high, and then we say, you know what, I'm going to add another 15 miles an hour to that wind. Now, what does it look like? Um, now, I can kind of see how that how that compares to my regular prescription. What if I do get that wind event? Um, 
what is that going to look like? So if you just lets you visually like see that. So holding, what I'm going to do is walk through a whole bunch of little slides here showing you um, the idea of what I'm going to do with my prescription and how I put that into my plan and then how I think about it um, when it comes to those critical holding points. So this is the template for holding. And the thing that was added after re the review is this last one. It's, it's letter D, that critical weather step up plan. And that again relates back to that sort of those un unanticipated events, drop in RH, um, wind, you know, wind event, et cetera. Things that might trigger you to do something a little bit differently. Um, so for IFTDIS, I think uh, section A and section D are the real places that IFTDIS can inform that and really give you a visual story on it. So back to our, um, our burn unit here on the Sawtooth. And in this case, what I've done is you can see the dashed lines. I think you can see them, they're probably pretty light, but they're da these dashed green lines, that's actually the forest boundary. So this burn unit is just kind of sandwiched in between this forest boundary. Um, it's only a little less than a mile to the west and a half mile to the east. Uh, there's also a structure up here to the north, a um, little less than a mile. And then further out, which I like with 50 disk being able to zoom out a little bit more, the, the colors on the map that we're looking at is rate of spread. So in three miles off to the west, there's actually a little town, there's some structures, there's some homes, and then a little bit five miles off to the east, the same thing. It's that ag land that we saw in that Google Earth image. So this is our moderate prescription parameters. You know, nothing fancy here, but you can see rates of spread here. If say we had, uh, normally they would burn this with a west wind, but say they got a wind switch of some kind, and now we've got our fire moving off to the west from an east wind. This is rate of spread, and the orange and the yellow pixels on here are like between 20 to 50 chains per hour. So, you know, the fire could be getting up and moving there. It's mostly because there's some grass and grass shrub there. So I can see that on the map, and I can see that my forest boundary is very close to my burn unit. So based on that, you know, step one is to run that landscape fire behavior using your prescription. And then step two is to identify those values, the things I care about as a burn boss. So what I can do is run through each of the pieces of my prescription, high end, low end, flame length, rate of spread, all that, and start to see what I call a theme. Like what is the theme that I'm starting to see when I look at this spatially um, on the map? So in this case, um, I'm saying everything's everything's the same as what I talked to you earlier about as far as fuel models and all that. But what I did is I ran the high end of my prescription, that flame length. This is we're looking at flame length. And I just went in and I circled the areas that show the areas that I would be most worried about. Um, mostly because it's it, the flame length here is like from 11 to 25 feet. Um, even 8 to 11 is the orange pixel. Um, so it's like, oh, well, those are some areas I might want to concentrate on and see what's going on. And so I'm just going to circle those. And again, this is the high end of my prescription. Um, you can see the parameters over here on the left. So low end of my prescription. Now let's look at the other end for flame length. Mm, look at that, same thing. So now I've got a lot more green, of course, because I'm burning at a much lower end of my prescription. Mostly it's because it's higher fuel moistures but I still have this red and orange out here to the west. And the east side still has some red and orange also. So that's flame length again. And I'm like, okay, so that's that's similar to what I saw in the last picture. So let's go to rate of spread now. And high end of my prescription on rate of spread. And this east side keeps popping up. It's like, hmm, okay, that, that now I know that there's something going on here that I might wanna pay. I might want to get out there, or maybe we need to do mitigation, or maybe we just need to have a discussion about how we're going to handle it for contingency. And then I circled this little spot here on the south line, just because I didn't see that spot before. And then again, on the west side, I didn't circle it, but you can kind of see there's still some red and orange over here. So that's rate of spread. And if we go the low end of for rate of spread, this west side still keeps cropping up. As a, as a, even on the low end, still is showing some uh, some faster rates of spread. Maybe not too big a deal, but it's you know it's still notable. And then crown fire potential um, on the west side again. There's the, that little clump of red pixels that straddles my burn unit boundary. Um, 
So that's a that's a that's a spot I want to keep my eye on. And then finally, on the low end, that crown fire, same thing. I'm still getting the sort of this passive torching ish crown fire type. Of, not really crown fire. It's really just torching. Um, but it's not surface fire. So I've got something. Go Obviously, there's some vegetation type out there that's causing that. Okay, so that's kind of now. This is my story, right? This is my theme. So when I put all these on the slide together, and I, I don't care whether it's rate of spread or flame length or crown fire, I can look and see now that this west side and this east side are definitely the corners I want to pay most attention to. And then I got a few like secondary areas, maybe this upper north line and maybe, you know, maybe this lower south line as a secondary. But it's really simple for me to see the problem areas. I can't do this and behave because it's not spatial. But I can do it in if this. And again, this is just running those basic prescription parameters. This isn't anything super fancy. And then I can take these and put them into my burn plan. And I can point out the things that matter to me most. And now when I go do my organization and equipment, I I can refer back to these locations. And you know, you're gonna have to make some decisions as both the plan writer and as the burn boss as to how you want to use this information. But at least now you have it and you can start um, being very critical about your thinking and deciding how we're going to address this stuff. So that's kind of the uh, the story I have with with the holding. And that's kind of what I wanted to show you with if this. Um, this is sort of my summary. You know, you don't have to be um, a mega analyst to do this sort of thing. Uh, I think it's pretty simple. It's really behave on a map. You know, it's pixel by pixel. Um, I think the maps are really useful and I'd like to be able to see my fire behavior. Location is everything when it comes to, to fire behavior. Numbers are helpful and we do need to put numbers in our plan, but having a map I think is probably a little more useful. Um, and a picture is really worth a thousand words, so why not use them and write less? I think we'd all appreciate that. So that's what I got. Cool, that's great, Kim, but who's got questions? Any questions or if I don't I know we're short on time, uh, but um, yeah, we're going to record this stuff 